I'd like to introduce you to someone. This is peace. Peace became a part of our family when my daughter Anya, who just turned nine, had lung surgery last December. In the recovery room afterward, they let you pick out one of these bears. Anya picked out this one and named her Peace. Anya was born with a cyst in her left lung, and it had grown to the point where it was taking up almost half the space in her lung. But this is amazing. They made a hole in the back of her shoulder narrower than this pencil, and they took the whole cyst right out through that little hole. She was completely recovered, back to normal in a few days. In the pre-op room before surgery, they gave us a piece of paper. And it said, basically, we are going to do whatever we want to your daughter, and you are going to accept it. I signed that piece of paper, and I had no doubt, no hesitation. I trusted these strangers with my daughter's life, and I didn't think twice about it. Because I knew that the doctors and nurses wanted to take good care of Anya. And not because they were going to get something self-interested out of it, but because they wanted to be good stewards. What the story of peace shows is, when people do their work with that stewardship mindset, it doesn't just change the personal meaning of work for each individual. It changes the public meaning of work. You can't separate stewardship from economics. When people do their work as good stewards, it makes it possible for us to trust strangers. And that is not normal in human history. For virtually all of history, people worked together, they bought and sold only with those of the same race, the same religion, the same cultural group. Outsiders could not be trusted. But when people do their work as good stewards, it becomes possible for us to love strangers by working together with them, by buying and selling with them. The modern entrepreneurial economy, which gives us abundant food and long lifespans and indoor plumbing, and computers and smartphones, and laparoscopic surgery is a product of that openness and trust. Take a closer look at this pencil. Many of you have read Leonard Reed's classic essay, I Pencil. Today that sounds like a new kind of mobile device, the I Pencil. <laughs> what Reed pointed out was, Thousands of people around the world have got to cooperate to make a pencil. They don't know each other. They are all different races, different religions, different classes, different cultures. But they can work together through economic exchange because they trust each other to be stewards. In the uh, entrepreneurial economy, we love strangers with our work and we trust strangers in economic exchange. And that is why, with all of its faults, with all of its limitations, with all of uh, the serious challenges that it can create for us, the entrepreneurial economy has unleashed the power of human work for love, justice, and reconciliation in unprecedented ways. You want to talk about a story of peace? When Jesus came into the world, every culture in the world had a dualistic mindset. Material life and spiritual life were strictly separated. So you had a leisure class who looked after moral and spiritual things and a working class that took care of material needs. The leisure class had dignity and rights. And they ate their food by taking it 
from the working class, which had no dignity and no rights. Jesus redeemed a people for himself, and he taught us that God is three people working together. God is three people working together, and all of us in his image are made to work together in our communities. That means you can't have a leisure class and a working class. We all weave the fabric of our culture and our civilization as we work together and exchange with one another as fellow stewards. And Jesus' apostles insisted on philozenos, literally, love for strangers. Like I said, you can't separate stewardship from economics. By redeeming us, by teaching us to work together as fellow stewards and to love strangers, Jesus planted the seeds which grew over a long period of time through many twists and turns into a new way of life and a new kind of economy. Think about this. When we were in the waiting room, we saw people of every race, every religion, every social class. There were women in headscarves. There were people who didn't speak the language. And across every kind of social barrier, every kind of difference, people were being good to each other. People were kind to each other in their hour of vulnerability. That is not normal in human history. Talk about a story of peace. We are living in a new kind of culture. And the entrepreneurial economy is one critical part of it. Living and working in an economy where we love strangers and trust strangers has been one of the most important factors in tearing down walls of hatred between races, between religions, between classes, between cultures. Will's story about the, uh, what he wished he'd said at the gas station shows that the logic is embedded and it can be brought out and made explicit. Not to mention the fact that when the economy is growing, that helps us all to work together, to create wealth together ethically, instead of fighting each other when resources are scarce, to take resources away from each other. You can't separate stewardship from economics. If we want people to love each other and do justice to each other, we have to teach them. All people are made to be fellow stewards. Everyone has something to contribute. And work and economic exchange don't just move stuff around. We need to be creating value for each other. Households can earn an honest paycheck. Businesses can make an honest profit by doing good ethical work that makes the world better than it was. The contribution that you make to others through your work gives meaning and purpose to the compensation that you receive for your work. And of course we need to be generous with wealth after we've created it. Households, businesses, communities, and nations all need to produce more than they consume wherever possible because love for neighbor involves that, as Paul insisted. We're all in this together. So we all have to find grace-based and responsible ways of working together across every sector of society to all help each other live in this way, producing more than we consume. That means we need to stand up for opportunity, 
Justice demands that every household has an opportunity to support themselves through their own work, not dependent on permission or largesse from the rich and powerful. All people should have the same rights to work, to own, to buy and sell, to save up, to build something. I'll tell you, the poison of paternalism sleep, seeps in so easily. Very recently, I was taking Anya and a friend of hers somewhere, and the friend said to me, my father works at a school, but he's not a teacher, he's just a maintenance man. I said to her, you know what? I think being a maintenance man is just as important as being a teacher. She smiled and said, I think so too. And then Anya said, I don't think so. <laughs> it just goes to show, we have to teach this to our children. <laughs> we can't take this for granted. None of the great champions of vocation in history ever took this for granted. From Moses, to Solomon, to Paul, to Gregory the Great, to Luther, to Calvin, to Wesley, to Kuiper, to John Paul II, to some of the people who are sitting in this room. None of them took this for granted. They didn't limit vocation to the personal meaning of work. They stood up for the public meaning of work. They insisted that all people are fellow stewards. And our communities today are desperate for this, aren't they? polarized and paralyzed. They're crying out for someone to offer a moral vision that will bring people together onto common ground. What would happen if Christians stepped up and showed our communities how we can come together and overcome greed and materialism and debt and dependency? What would happen? During the Reformation, Martin Luther and his movement stood up for ordinary workers against the paternalism of the priesthood. They planted the seeds that grew into religious freedom and constitutional democracy. During the Industrial Revolution, John Wesley and his movement stood up for ordinary workers against the paternalism of the aristocracy and the landed gentry. They planted the seeds that grew into the entrepreneurial economy and equal rights for all citizens. Today, if our movement embraced the public meaning of work and stood up for ordinary workers against the rising forms of paternalism in our own day, what seeds might we sow? The story of peace is still being written. At home and around the world, millions of little girls like Anya are counting on us to help write it. It won't be easy. There's a long way left to go and a lot of problems to be faced. But I can't think of anything I'd rather do. Can you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a quick question for you. Um, I was really delighted when I heard you talk about trust, and trust as being essential in an, in an economy, especially our modern capitalist economy. Uh, I think that's very true. But I think you'd agree that trust, if it hasn't completely collapsed, it's been seriously destroyed, yes? Over Absolutely, the last... and there's a good deal of social science data tracking. Uh, people will ask the question, 
uh, do, are people fair to strangers or questions like that that measure your expectation of social trust? Those numbers are going down. They're, they're going down. It's a bad thing. So my question is, how as Christians can we re rebuild trust? Is there a difference between being um, a stewardship economy in a Christian community and the broader secular community? I think there's always a tension between the way Christians live in their intentional theological communities and the way they live in the world. But we are called to be in the world as well as not of the world and loving our neighbors. I think there are two things that immediately come to mind. One is we should trust strangers. Uh, in your New Testament, everywhere it says hospitality, where it says hospitality, the original Greek word is philozenos. What we're called to is not to let people you know crash on your couch. What we're called to is loving strangers. We dem if we demonstrate love for strangers, I think we make it plausible. The other thing we can do, which was very beautifully expressed in Will's story of what he wished he had said, take that implicit trust and make it explicit. Show that, you know, if you buy and sell with people, that implies you ought to treat them with respect and trust them and treat them as fellow stewards. Hey, we need to do more of that. We need to be intentional about treating people with respect and dignity. I think that's a, a service Christians can bring.